that perspective I wish was different. That perspective that is like, this is not an acute condition. This is a chronic condition. This has been with me for a long time, right? I stub my toe, my toe hurts, that's acute. That's gonna go away, that shouldn't come back unless I stub my toe. If something that I've been experiencing for years and years and years, that's more than just a simple fix, right? That's not a Band-Aid, and I think of diets as Band-Aids. Trying to solve that issue with a diet never really worked. Paige Dorian Productions, welcome back to the American Glutton Podcast. Thank you. I really wanted to welcome you for a change. Oh, let's go. You can okay. welcome me. I would like to be welcome. Let's do this. Here we go. Ethan Suplee, welcome to your American Glutton Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate my welcome. This is a, that was a little homage to Michael Malice, who, whose podcast is called You're Welcome, Why oh. You Are. Oh my God, brilliant. See, I yeah. didn't even know it. I like Michael Malice. Uh, great. Well, you know what we're going to do today? We're going to talk about a topic that a lot of people actually ask questions about. And I want to get your thoughts on this and let's get into it. Are you ready? Yep. Let's do this. All right. Here's the topic. Navigating weight loss as a beginner. Tell us what you wish you knew. Navigating weight loss as a beginner. There's, you know, I think, I think there's a, a few different facets here to, to talk about. One is like, it's very difficult to have done something for a long time and go like, I've gleaned a lot of information and insight into this thing, into my experience in this thing. And I, I wish there were some aspects I had known back then because, you know, it's similar to my experience with interventions. If I had just understood what those guys were saying when they said, we're concerned and we want you to stop using drugs. If I had just agreed with them in that moment, you know, life would have been better. So there's some parts where I go like, if I could go back and just tell myself, here's the whole, the whole riddle is wrapped up in this idea. And that idea is not proving correct. Or if you think about it a different way, you'll have more success. I don't know that I can, I would have been able to do that without having gone through it so many times. And even thinking about like weight loss and weight regain, um, which I thought about so long as failures, I think part of it that kept me going time after time after time was this idea that I can lose weight, right? Like I had, I knew I was capable of weight loss. If somebody came to me and said, I've never been able to lose weight, like I've tried all these diets and I've never lost weight, I would go like, whoa, that's crazy. Let's really investigate the hell out of that. You've never lost a single pound on the scale. If you stop eating carbohydrates, you're not even purging your system of that glycogen. Like what's really going on there? There would be something to investigate there. Um, and I hear a lot from people like I can't lose weight. It's so hard. And I want to know, like, does that mean you literally, the scale has never gone down. It's only static or going up or, you're, you're able to lose some weight and then you can't stick to the diet and then you gain it back, right? What, mm -hmm. what is the metric we're defining for weight loss? And so I lose weight, I regain the weight, I think of that as a failure, right? Because the idea is always like weight loss will be permanent, right? Um, yeah. And so I think like the, the most base and basic thing that I wish I had thought of differently, or I wish I had known for myself, is that I was attempting to handle an acute, I'm sorry, I was attempting to handle a chronic condition with acute means. It's It would be like if you had such a deep cut that it was not going to heal unless you got stitches, and you kept just putting a Band-Aid on it right? 
and wow. going like, well, for, for a minute, the blood stops coming out and then the blood keeps coming out. Like, what am I doing wrong? I just want it to stop bleeding. And it's like, well, you know, you've ruptured a artery and if you don't get that artery sealed up, it's going to continue pushing so much blood through your skin that the skin's never going to have a chance to heal or something like that, right? I keep having a headache and um, I'm taking aspirin and then eight hours later, my headache comes back. What's going on? Okay, let's figure out what's causing the headache and actually do battle with that. You know what I mean? So for me, I believe very much that my being overweight was a symptom or a byproduct of other things in my life that didn't really get settled down and managed until I started addressing those things. And then it all kind of fell into place, right? And so the process by which you reduce your stored fat is through consuming less energy than you're using. And that can be done in a multitude of structures. So it could you could figure that out by doing intermittent fasting or keto or vegetarianism, but the overall principle remains the same. Your body is is requires more energy than you're feeding it. And so it's taking the additional energy from your stored fat. Um, but that is secondary for me to the fact that like, I ate to avoid discomfort and I was uncomfortable with myself at all times. You know, if I'm, I ate to achieve a sort of blissful euphoria that I, that I got from eating so much that I couldn't physically put more food into my body. And this caused this state where I had to like sit still and just feel like a dopamine rush almost right from binge eating. Um, I ate to address sadness. I ate to um, enhance joy, right? So if I was having like some manic period, food made it better. These are the reasons I ate. Um, I ate out of anxiety. If I felt anxious, uh, food could calm me. None of that is getting addressed by going on a diet for three or six months. None of it. So if I set up this paradigm by which like I'm going to be consuming less energy than my body requires for a short period of time, and I think that's going to solve everything I just told you about. So when I come out of this, right, because a diet where you're restricting your energy intake cannot last forever. You cannot be consuming less because eventually your body's going to start to consume lean tissue. And when you run out of that, it's going to start to consume organs and then you die. Right? So this is not a permanent thing. Once you're done, there's all this other shit that's still there. That's like now when the guardrails are off and I'm not checking my eating, the weight comes back. So it's really just more that perspective I wish was different. That perspective that is like, this is not an acute condition. This is a chronic condition. This has been with me for a long time, right? I stub my toe, my toe hurts. That's acute. That's going to go away. That shouldn't come back unless I stub my toe. If I break my toe, that's still acute. My toe is going to heal and it should heal in such a way that hopefully I don't have chronic pain. But, but something that I've been experiencing for years and years and years, that's more than just a simple fix, right? That's not a Band-Aid. And I think of diets as Band-Aids. And so trying to solve that issue with a diet never really worked. And when I say it never really worked, they produced weight loss. The diets all produced weight loss. And so when I when I think about other people and what their experience is and trying to give them something relatable and they say, I, can't, I just can't lose weight. I want to know, do you mean that you've tried a multitude of diets and never experienced a reduction of weight ever in any sense or that the weight comes back? Because mm -hmm. I experienced the weight coming back so many times and it made me feel like I couldn't lose weight because the weight felt like it was just hiding for a little bit, you know? 
Um, yeah. but in fact I can lose weight. Um, and I, and I do understand also that like I can lose weight pretty easily. Uh, I've talked to you about this and I've talked to my wife about this and it seems that you two gals actually have a harder time just losing weight than I do. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's another conversation to have and try to understand that. Right. Um, I don't want to say that my experience with weight loss is super easy. It's not all just pleasant and rainbows and I go on a diet and then I come off the diet and like the weight just magically comes back, but none of it takes effort. It all takes effort. But the perceived effort that Brandy has to go through, you know, and now there are a number of factors here, right? She has so much less or has ever had so much less weight than me to lose that I think the lower your starting point, the nearer to your absolute goal that you are, mm -hmm. um, the harder it becomes, the more friction you will encounter biologically. Um, so there, there's just so many factors, right? I think, I think this is such an interesting subject because there are so many factors and so much nuance. And I think it's irritating too sometimes when we go, when we read books or we go online and it's just all prescribed as some universal thing, right? Like everybody will have the same experience and it's this one thing that everybody needs to do. And when they do that, everybody will have the same results. And I'm like, you know, if you just eat, there's the guy who just eats raw bull testicles. And it's like, if you just live a primal lifestyle, you will look like me. And he's this fucking gigantic guy, right? And, um, all muscles, uh, who looks like one of those cows, you know, those cows that they like <laughs> give certain drugs to and the cows are just pure muscle from eating grass. He yeah. reminds me of that. And it's just like, it's send, send this person out to the pasture and eat everything grass fed and you will just get fucking yoked. Um, or the, the, you know, the people who are like, no, you just have to intermittent fast. And within the window, you will never overeat. Uh, and, and you can eat whatever you want. And it's this magical thing. You can eat Big Macs and pizza. You know, I had a girl seriously try to sell me on intermittent fasting by like going out to dinner with her and my wife. It wasn't like weird. And she was like, look at how much dessert I can have. It's because I have a three hour eating window. And she had three desserts with dinner and like, okay, that's cool. But you're also lost a little bit of weight and then didn't lose anymore. You know, it's your weight loss stopped and you never got to a place where you were like, this is me forever, forever. I'm eating three desserts and I'm, I've had all the results I've ever wanted. That's not the case. Okay. So I find it very profound that you just made this you just talked about it being a chronic condition versus an acute condition. Like, I don't know why I feel like I've never heard it put that way, even from you. Like, I feel like this is really something to pause on because, and the example of, you know, I have an artery bleeding and I keep putting on a band aid. Yeah. It stops for a little bit and then it starts gushing again. Here it goes. Like, this is such a great point that I'm like, I, I don't know for me, it may, it just, I got that like deeply. Um, and yeah, it's, it's also so, uh, it's such a reminder, this thing that, cause I've done all the diets too. And it's like, yeah, you sign up for something or you hear about one or your friend tells you about the one that they lost all the weight on and da, 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 da. And it's like, there are so many other factors and men versus women and who has a, maybe some other health condition going on. And I mean, it's so many different things. Your wife and I are different points in our lives with like, you know, women's bodies and things happen and it is genuinely sometimes hard, whatever, all that stuff. So the, the one size fits all is not, is not necessarily correct. And this point of like that it's a chronic condition and let's look beyond just, okay. And it, yeah, I, I mean, for those it, by, of us, by the way, it's, it, it, this was the most, sorry, this was the most overlooked thing for me mm -hmm. that I, never considered for forever. I just never thought about it. I, j I just was behaving as though it was an acute condition. I wasn't thinking of it as an acute condition because I wasn't analyzing it at all. Yeah. If I think about Clementine, Clementine is uh, 18 years old, 
or 19 years old. Sorry, Clementine. And <laughs> she has type 1 diabetes, which she's had for since she was four years old. So for 15 years. Um, if her blood sugar goes high, she takes insulin and her blood sugar comes down. If we considered that she was done at that moment because she solved that instance of high blood sugar and she never had to worry about it again, she would have a really, really rough life, right? Mm -hmm. Now, there are things she does in life that are considerations in order to not have a high blood sugar spike. And she still has to take insulin. But this condition of hers is chronic. It is something that isn't going to go away. And so if we consider that our condition is just being fat, we can make being fat go away, right? So it seems like not a chronic condition, acute condition. However, if it keeps coming back, possibly we have to think about it differently. Mm -hmm. And so if you have uh, the, the, the most, uh, the, the, the idea that jumps to my mind like immediately is a woman who gains weight during pregnancy, right? Who never had a, a, a instance of feeling that she was overweight prior to pregnancy. She gets pregnant. She has the kid. The kid's out breastfeeding is also difficult for weight gain and weight loss. So she's just, just the most mentally stable person ever. Doesn't think about it at all. Finishes, weans her kid off breast milk and then examines her body and goes, shit, I'd like to lose 20 pounds. I wouldn't go to that person and go like, well, let's think about your behaviors. Let's think about your compulsions. No, that to me appears to be an acute condition. Yeah. Um, if you have a guy who, uh, you know, loses his job and sorry, loses his job and winds up sitting at home more often playing video games and spends six months like that, puts on 20 pounds, then gets another job and goes like, Oh, I put on 20 pounds that I wasn't paying attention to. Again, I wouldn't try to have him examine his entire life and his behaviors and his compulsions. I, I was put on my first diet at five. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't go on a diet of my own volition until I was like 22. And at 22, I just didn't think of it as anything, but I need to lose weight. That's it. That's the whole game. And then I spent 15 years thinking of it that way. I just need to lose weight. And I lost weight and gained weight and lost weight and gained weight and lost weight and gained weight. I suspect there are other people out there that have had that experience and also aren't thinking about it because, because you can get rid of weight. You can lose it. That's just not, in my opinion, the actual issue. That's a symptom of the issue. That's a byproduct of the issue. That's a result of the issue. And so if we never figure out what the issue is, mm -hmm. we're never going to have long-term success. We're never going to be fully capable of actually managing the condition and the condition will keep popping its head up. And by the way, I say that and I consider like as a sober person that I will be managing that condition for the rest of my life. And if I stop managing that condition, the wheels fall off the bus of my life. My life goes to shit. Um, and, and I think my way is the same. And you could say, unfortunately or fortunately, fortunately, I'm thinking about it this way and I'm managing it, you know, yeah. really in a, in a way that I'm more successful at than I've ever been in my whole life. Mm -hmm. There's never been a period of time where I was at a weight that I was relatively happy with for as long as I've been. Now I wake up some days and think I'm fat and get on the scale and see a number and go like, but I've been so happy with that number for so long. Why do I feel fat today? So that still happens too. And I have to accept that that's part of it too. And that's part of my chronic condition, right? And that's part of what I have to manage because that feeling can send me to McDonald's. 
Right. <laughs> which is all wrapped up in the condition, which has, which weight is a byproduct of. Right. And how many years now has it been that you've been in this place? Cause I, I just sort of have like a, I don't know how many years it's been. I just have a time period in my mind of like remembering, oh my God, Ethan has this, you've figured this out for yourself. You know what I mean? That this, like, how long has that been now? 2018, I got to this weight and was still doing like really structured maintenance, Mm. you know, where I was like, I had a notebook, I was writing everything down and doing calculations. And so that was me figuring out like, oh, if I want this for life, if I want this for long term, I got to do a version of this forever. Okay, well, what does this look like? Let me figure out what, how much energy all this food has in it and how much energy my body needs, and then figure out some pattern that I can follow where I'm not over energizing my body. And that excess energy is fat stores Mm -hmm. as fat. Um, and it, again, it really doesn't matter if you're consuming any of the macro nutrients in, in too high a quantity, you're going to wind up storing them as fat. Your body can turn any of it into glucose. Um, and you can, you can still store fat. Even if your body is uh, being fueled by ketones, those can be stored as fat too. Like, the bottom line is those structures um, are useful insofar as they allow you to manipulate how much energy you're taking in. That's why they're useful. And they're not useful universally. One can be a structure that's super beneficial to somebody and not work at all for another person. Um, so, you know, I I get super weary of anybody making any my microphone sorry i get super weary of anybody making absolute claims um because like there's context to everything you know if somebody's trying to handle eczema through diet that's not the same as somebody who's trying to handle obesity through diet and who knows if the person who's trying to handle eczema and his eczema is a direct result of eating processed sugar Um, and he's only eating processed sugar when he's feeling dejected about a girl, which happens to be quite a bit, you know, and then it's like, no, okay, you're feeling dejected about a girl. You're going to the 7-Eleven and getting Slurpees and Big Gulps, and then you're getting eczema and okay, so you're just trying to white knuckle it through, uh, not eating sugar, but really the problem is that it's that's your, that's what your, that's what makes you feel better when you're feeling down about a girl. Okay. How about we find something else to make you feel better when you're feeling down about the girl? How about we start with that? Why are you feeling down about the girl? What is that? Like, let's actually get into that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. these are, these are the types of things that have really, really helped me. Um, simply because like, I, I can lose weight. It's not super hard for me to lose weight. What's super hard for me to do is to maintain weight without managing this other condition that is probably unique to me while there are similarities to others. Mm -hmm. But like, I think it's got a lot wrapped up in my life's experience. Okay. And so let's say now you're a person who you realize this, you're going to approach it from this way. Um, you know, you were explaining that you sat down and you figured out, okay, how much do I really need to do here? You know, calories in, calories out. Like you're very um, adept and smart in this way. And some of us are not, you know, we just kind of like, go, I don't get it. What's a macro? So, <laughs> um, you know, what's, what's like, let's call it a second step, but do, you know, how does your average person go about figuring out that plan for themselves. Okay. Yeah. No, Obviously I told many ways, but you know what I, I hear what you're saying. And I, I think it's applicable to you no matter what structured plan you're on. Like if you're, if you're trying to solve this with veganism, you can still figure out your energy needs. If you're trying to handle this through 
carnivore, or keto, you can still figure out your energy needs and, and just go like, okay. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is like the, the two pathways towards uh, the desire in human beings to eat. One is the homeostatic. That means your body literally needs more fuel to operate, right? It, it, it's going like we need actual fuel to get through our day or to produce some task you're asking us to produce. Um, and the other one is called the hedonic pathway. And that is like, I guess it probably started when we were cavemen and, uh, you know, stuff like fruit was relatively rare. And so you're walking through the, and I apologize to all my non-evolutionary people who are listening to this. You can think of it in whatever way you want to think of it. At some point there became a process within our bodies that would, um, cause us to have a desire to overeat. And that would be like, if, if you come upon a berry bush or a honey pot in nature and you've been com away from it, there will be the desire to overconsume that because it's rare. And so now, and this, this is like what food advertising does. You drive by a billboard of a cheeseburger that can produce a feeling of hunger or a desire to eat when your body doesn't need fuel the omnipresence of highly palatable foods can be tough to navigate because you can constantly have the feeling of wanting to eat because it's in your face all the time. You go to get gas, you're checking out, there's Snicker bars and Slim Jims and savory treats and sweet treats and cinnamon buns and all of that shit. And just seeing it can spark the desire of wanting to eat. Another one can be boredom. Being bored, having the thought, wouldn't food enhance this feeling of boredom? Yes, that's the hedonic pathway. Mm -hmm. Understanding that and that that's what's happening and going like, I only really want it. My, my desire for a, a time is to eat to fuel my body. Okay, so now we know that that's something and we know that there's this other system at play there. And when you walk in to get your gas and you prepare yourself, I'm going to see a lot of shit that tastes really good that's going to make me want to eat it. I'm going to fight that. Okay, here I go to get my gas. And I see it, I see it, it's doing it. God, I love you know, Kit Kats and peanut butter cups and all that stuff. But I know that that desire is not real. That's not for fuel. That's how I navigate that. Um, another thing to do is like any system that you are going to use. I do better when I'm vegan. I do better or I have moral issues and that's why I'm vegan. Or I feel better when I'm eating a lot of fat and meat. Okay, fine. You can still figure out a baseline and go like, I'm just going to do this process and I'm going to actually measure the amount of energy I'm taking in. There are apps that can help you. There are Google calculators where you can, where it can spit out a, an approximate of how much energy you should be consuming every day. And then you just start keeping track and keep diligent track of it. And if your weight starts to inch up and you're keeping track of it, you go like, oh, 3,000 calories a day is too much, even if it's just fat and meat. Maybe I trim some off and let's see how I feel. Today, I'm going to have 2,800 calories and do that for two weeks and see where I'm at. And if I'm maintaining, then that's where your maintenance calories are for that weight. If you lose a bunch of weight, your maintenance calories are going to go down. So it takes work, you know, and I think that that was another thing I was really unwilling to do for so long. And I, I will say this. <clears throat> The diet industry is very good at selling you ideas of get rich quick schemes or quick fixes or one stop shopping of like, if you just do X, X solves everything, right? If you just don't eat meat, you're good, you're fine. If you just eat in a window of time, you're good, you're fine. If you just cut out lectins, you're good, you're fine. If you just eat for your blood type, if you just eat only meat, right? Like, those were not successful for me because a lot of my uh, condition is about overeating. It's not about eating for hunger. Those, uh, those all presuppose we're only eating out of hunger, mm. right? And so, and that you're overeating 
something and that if you take that all away, then you won't overeat. Um, that was not my experience. I very rarely overate for hunger. I mean, I, I overate because I liked the feeling of overeating. That's mm -hmm. got nothing to do with hunger. You know, I have to sometimes like now my hunger cues are irritability. That's not typically what I think of when I think of hunger. I think of my stomach literally creating a feeling of put food in here. We're empty, not just being irritable. I go like, why am I irritable? Oh, perhaps I need to eat some food. I've missed lunch. I'm irritable. You know, that wasn't, that wasn't my experience with overeating. Overeating was I'm down. I'm anxious. I'm sad. I'm happy. I feel uncomfortable in my own skin. Let me see what food will do. Oh, it makes me feel better. It's distracting me from the discomfort of life. Um, <laughs> those don't get solved with take out carbohydrates and you will handle your feeling of discomfort. No, I didn't. I'll overeat pork rinds and steak. I will do it. I did it. I was able to do it. Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I'm just thinking about my own reasons for overeating. That's all. That's why I'm smiling. But yeah, that makes so much sense. And also just back to your point, it, it really such a reminder that the diet culture, the diet industry does do that, right? Like you just need to this or you just need to that. And it feels like there's always a new thing that we just need to do. And, or they're a variation of one of those things. And not to say that like we have our friend Loren, right, who doesn't have a weight problem at all, but she's very interested in health. She was on the podcast. Um, she goes down the roads of carnivore or high fat or all these things because she wants to know what it's how it's going to make her body feel, right? And so there's all these other reasons why you can do all those things, but the weight loss part of it is like, yeah, it just gets shoved to us. And those of us that have been and still are desperate for like a solution – yeah, then we go, well, this must be the one, but none yeah, of Yeah, there's the presupposition with a lot of those diets where you, I read them and I go like, that's, that makes a lot of sense. Like, mm -hmm. I happen to like MSG quite a bit, monosodium glut glutamate, mm -hmm. um, which is found naturally in shellfish and Parmesan cheese and tomatoes, and it exists naturally. It's not um, utterly synthetic. The kind used in cooking is synthetic. I like that. Doritos have MSG in them. MSG makes things magically delicious. You can <laughs> cover a steak in MSG and cook it, and it will be the best steak you've ever had in your whole life. Mm -hmm. Another thing MSG does is it masks satiety. So mm -hmm. MSG can not, no absolutes, again, remember, we, I don't, I don't do that. So even if I say an absolute, if you come at me with like, you presented this as an absolute, I would go, yeah, sorry. I don't even believe it as an absolute. Yeah. But one of the things that MSG can do to some people or many is it can blunt the feeling of fullness. And so you're eating and it's already magically delicious and it's having this chemical process where it's slowing down your body's reaction to food to going like, we've had food. We're no longer hungry. So you get these Dorito chips and they've got this little flavor enhancer MSG, which is fucking marvelous stuff. And part of what it does is it makes it taste better. And another part of what it does is it slows down the body's feeling of satiety. And so you just keep eating them, Bet you can't just eat one, right? What was that? Lay's? I don't think Lay's has MSG. Um, but like, there's a reason why they win that bet because yeah. you eat one and your body goes like, fucking give me more of that. That is delicious. Um, and so, you know, there are, there are advocates out there who go like, it's the processed food. If we just eliminate the processed food, we handle the obesity crisis. And I go like, ah, you did, wouldn't have handled it for me because my mom eliminated processed food from my life for quite some time. And I never, it did not handle my obesity at all. Mm -hmm. If we look at the landscape of America and you regulated or eliminated processed food, I bet it would put a big dent in obesity, mm -hmm. but it doesn't, on an individual basis, it would not have handled it for me because I tried that route that as a scheme and it didn't do it. 
I don't think that um, taking that out of your diet is a bad system, but I don't think it gets you all the way there. Do, 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 you, do you know what I'm saying? So yes. anybody who's out there going, we just need government regulation of processed foods. I'm like, maybe, I mean, maybe you have some big nation, national success in obesity if you do that, but I, I still would have struggled. I would have turn to overeating unprocessed food, which is what I did when my mom took processed food out of the house, which let's be honest, there was never processed food in our house. It was all fucking hippie granola. And like, I, I was a kid drinking Hanson's when other kids drank Coke because it was unprocessed. It was natural. Hanson's natural soda. Guess what? It's got the same amount of calories or just about, and your body will store it as fat, just like anything else. So it's like, what you got to get kind of specific with what your condition is and what you're dealing with and the the dynamics by which you live your day-to-day life and how all these things affect you um it's it's real work you know it it isn't i haven't seen a single person who just went keto lost all the weight they needed to lose lived their life happily ever after and is five or six years into like, yeah, no, that's just how I eat. And, and, and if you do find that person, they're rare, right? Mm-hmm. I haven't seen that person, but I, you, I'm sure you could find them because again, no absolutes, but you find that person. It's like, okay, that's one person. I've known 50 people who have done keto and, and, and none of them had that success. Mm-hmm. So my plea is like, don't trust these things because if any of them were absolutely true, the whole thing would be solved. There's yeah. lots of people who don't eat processed foods and are overweight. Mm-hmm. So that's not the solution to an individual's obesity, I don't think. Maybe yeah. it is once in a while, but not broadly. Mm-hmm. And is there something to be said for, okay, so now I've you know, I'm taking all the steps we're talking about, right? I'm a new person on my journey. And then is there something to be said for a bit of education? Because like, here you are explaining this thing about MSG, right? Which like, I've totally had that experience of eating Doritos and feeling five minutes later, like, I'm gonna need some more snacks, this, you know, work snack table, whatever. And it's all, I mean, I've had, (laughs) yeah, whatever. We don't need to go down my roads of overeating chips. But at that point of it, it masking satiety, that's not something I think I knew, not something I think many people know. And that's just one of so many things. Cause like, do you think part of it then is like a bit of education on what you're eating and the effects it can have on you as you're going to now figure out your plans and make your choices? Yeah. And by the way, I'll fucking eat a Dorito right here, right now. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not even saying treat Doritos like they're heroin and you're a junkie and you have to get away from them. I'm not, that's not my point. My point is like, if you're, if you're new and starting out and going like, how can I create a system and a structure that I can have success on? Maybe Doritos are off the table for a while, because if you understand, like there are satiety masking, uh, properties to MSG, um, So like we take a break from Doritos. They're not forever off the table. This is the other tricky thing with like, I love abstinence. Abstinence for me is just glorious thing with drugs and alcohol. Um, It doesn't work for food. Food is, is not something I can be abstinent from. There's certain things I don't like. And so I don't eat them. But like, even if my kids all outvoted me because, um, we do tend to run our household in a communistic manner. Uh, as we broaden out and we add more people to the idea of life, I no longer like communism. But like, if the kids all want to go eat Chinese food and I feel like, you know, burgers, then that vote wins and we we act as a communal organism in that sense. You yeah. know, I think of it more like, my wife and I are strictly communistic and then the, my children are like my serfs, but they get a say, you know what I mean? <laughs> they, they have some voice and we listen to the people and we, we try to behave, uh, at least, uh, on the surface as though their, their voice matters. Um, so 
we run into a situation where it's like everybody wants to go eat the stuff. I don't want to eat that stuff. Okay. And then I either sit it out and I'm not going with them or I make alternate plans or, or whatever. Um, I forgot what your question was. I, I went I was talking about Sorry. No, it's cool. I was talking about the education. Oh, you know, yeah. Uh, I, think edu- I think education and understanding is important. And also like for me, not clinging to absolutes has become really important. But really, it's because so many of these things I clung to as like, we all have grain brain. Mm -hmm. Everyone has grain brain. And this is the problem. And I was a zealot in believing that. It's just not fucking true in an absolute sense. Maybe grain brain exists for somebody and it's causing all their problems. But guess what? It doesn't for me. And I was behaving and as though it was. So the, and if you look at science, science doesn't even fuck with absolutes. Science is all like, here's where the evidence points. That's what I'm looking at now. Where does the evidence point? Mm -hmm. And understanding that that's going to be disproven one day. It's always been disproven, always eventually gets disproven. We just think science is stopping progress today. No, we're going to move into the future. And at some point, they're going to look back on now and go, those morons believe that? That's how they were treating the universe? At some point, they're going to figure out fucking dark matter. You know, 95% of the universe, they don't even know what it is. They can't, they, it's got to be there because the universe in their model doesn't work unless it's there, but they can't detect it in any way. 95% of the universe. So you think today all the fucking research papers are done? No, they're going to prog, they're going to progress. They're going to go forward. They're going to learn new things. So figure out, look at the evidence today, what it suggests, behave that way, and understand that it's all going to get disproven eventually. But we don't know what that is, so you just go based on the evidence today. None of the evidence today says you're going to handle your obesity by doing any of these one simple things. None of it. Mm -hmm. None of it suggests you're going to get all the way to any idea of a goal by doing one simple thing. So. Yeah, gather as much data and evidence as you possibly can and know that it's all going to be wiped out eventually and there's going to be new data and evidence as we progress, as our scientific instruments become more fine-tuned, as we get better studies. You know, like that's really important to me because I was a zealot about carbohydrates. I was a zealot about grains. I was a zealot about X, Y, and Z. And, And I like was behaving as though I'd reached nirvana through this stuff. And it's like, no, I lost 10 pounds and then my weight loss stalled. And like, I still held on to it. Like, no, I've just got to, you know, like believe my way into this state of uh, enlightenment in weight loss by, you know, advocating for, you know, the, uh, the insulin model of, you know, whatever. Just, trial and error you've done if if you've done a multitude of diets anyways and you've gained the weight back then you know that those that that's what those produce so dig a little bit deeper look for more data figure out how much energy your body needs like this is what i would say it's a lot of work and you're you've got you're surrounded by marketing and advertising telling you no it's one step you just have to do one thing all of that's, you know, it's not, it's really easy. Just do X. X is going to solve your whole life. You got to fight through that. Yeah. God, I've had to fight so through good. that. Yes. No. And that's why we're listening to you, Ethan's plea. <laughs> I love this so much. It's, it's so good. Thank you so much for answering this. I think people are going to love it. Let us know what you think. All of y'all out there that are listening. Thank you, Paige. Good to see you. See you later. <laughs>